and welcome to Australian Women in Beekeeping. My name's Kate Bamford and we are here with Steve B. Murphy who is my bee buddy and I've Hi. known Steve for, for about four years. I met him on LinkedIn, something to do with bees. Steve and I were talking about it before, we can't remember. Anyway, um, we've gone on to uh, know each other very well as bee buddies and we've had a lot of adventures together with bees and cutouts and hives and all sorts of things. A lot. A lot. It's been great fun and, yep, continue to have a lot of fun. Mm. Uh, this interview with Steve is primarily about small cell foundation and his passion about small cell foundation. Mm. So, Steve, welcome. Hi. Thank you for coming along for this interview. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And so, would you like to give us a bit of a backstory? How did this all start for you? How did the world of bees start for you? Well, I've always just loved bees. Yes. You know, since I was a little kid. Yes. Yeah, I love bees. And then when I was uh, about 22, uh, a swarm came into my backyard and yep. um, I quickly had to put some timbers together and made a top bar beehive. Yeah. Uh, from just scrap timbers. Yeah. It's probably a bit small and a bit flimsy, yeah. but it worked. And? And we got honey. No. You know, yeah. Okay. But I had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> so do you know what you're yeah. doing now? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit more? Yeah, yeah. yeah just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Because yeah. Steve also um, teaches people beekeeping and yeah. the inaugural um, AWIB introduction to beekeeping mm. that we ran in January this year, it was actually mm. Steve who delivered the program. Yeah. And there was 14 uh, AWIBers who went up to Maui for the day and we had a great time. So anyway, so let's talk yeah. about small cell, Steve. How did you yeah. first hear about small cell? Well, about six years ago when I decided to try and start down the path of making my income from bees, mm -hmm. um, I realized I had to re-educate myself. Yeah. And I would spend about four to six hours a day, every day, mm -hmm. um, doing research on bees. Mm -hmm. And I did that solid for at least two years. Mm -hmm. So it was like doing a degree in beekeeping. Yep. And that's when I found out, uh, um, I learned a lot of things that are not commonly known. Yep. And one of them was to do with the size of bees oh, and okay. the impact that that has on bees. Yeah. You know, and and the controversy that that comes with it. Why do you think there's a controversy? Because one of the the, the department in America, their primary reason, right at the beginning, for for not wanting anyone to downsize their bees, was because then they would be the same size as Africanized bees. Okay. And then you can't see a physical difference. You then have to do a DNA test. Okay. You know? Um, and so the D DPI in America, when they were first given scientific papers about this, A, they never published the papers, mm -hmm. and B, they, the people who had submitted those papers, who were employees at the time, um, were summarily removed from the department. So who, who was, where did okay. this small cell come from? Who was the and person so, that was pioneering this? So the person that, that I found who's been the main pioneer mm. in the world is Dee Lusby. Okay, and okay. she's based in? She's in uh, America. Yep, and she's yeah. an established beekeeper? Oh yeah, she comes, she's like a sixth generation beekeeper, oh, okay. originating from Germany. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she's not a person without knowledge. Okay. Yeah. So do you know where she got the small cell foundation concept from? She was, uh, she when tracheal mites first came into America, yep. they came into America, I think about three years or four years before varroa mites did. And she looked around the world and went, well, other bees that are a bit smaller don't have a problem with tracheal mites. Mm. So she did an experiment and she downsized her bees to initially five uh five point one mil because mm. what's the standard cell size here in australia is 5.4 right. although recently here in victoria the main supplier of foundation has upped their size to 5.6 and is there any reason for that that you're aware of they didn't know that that was their size okay. until i informed them okay 
So going back down, what's what's a, a standard cell size for a so small cell? Generally standard around the world since about the 1950s yep. uh, is 5.4. Prior to the 1950s, um, a whole range of sizes, including small cell, yep. were available. Okay. But after, after World War II, um, all of the older beekeepers and the older equipment and the older equipment manufacturers yep all disappeared and for some reason then we were left only with 5.4 okay. and that became pretty much the worldwide standard so that's the standard so that's the that's the standard that um, the majority of beekeepers un understand to be traditional yeah. cell size yeah that's what beekeepers today would call standard cell yep. size okay okay yeah. okay so if you're above that or below that, then you're, you're outside the standard. Okay, okay. See, people used to, in the past, always used a different size in their brood chamber yep. to their honey chamber. Okay. You know, and comb, people who would make comb honey would use a, uh, a 5.7 or 5.8 mil mm. for making comb honey because people like this, the look of the larger cells. So do you, do you think that cell size is to do with satisfying the consumer? Has there been that been an influence? Only in comb honey. Yeah. And only in the past. Um, today, th that's hardly ever done. So why, what's the, uh, the advantages of 5.4 then? Why, um, was, why, why did 5.4 become the norm? Well, be, mostly because of one particular guy in the past yeah. who liked the larger bees. Um, and he was a Frenchman, he was very a good orator, and he was very good at promoting himself and what he liked. You know, and so 5.4 um, ended up being the standard. But it ended up that way also because the manufacturers of equipment changed so the people who were making the equipment for for small cell uh, they had switched production during the wartime mm. and they never went back to it oh. so that was lost okay. and the only people who were making equipment were people who were making 5.4 okay and so this is post-war this post is post-war post -war. yeah world war ii so by default we ended up with 5.4 as being uh, the standard okay Okay, you know? so then if someone's interested in small cell foundation, what's the benefits as far as you're concerned and your experience of um, small cell? One, uh, generally better disease control mm -hmm. overall. Like as, as an example, um, so six years ago, before I changed over to small cell, um, because I had to get my own equipment in, there was nobody in Australia back then. So you had to make your own. There was own absolutely small cell. no one even looking at this issue in Australia. So in order for you to produce the small cell foundation, you had to make it yourself. Yeah, I right. had to buy a wax press. Okay. Uh, that would, was specially made for me, mm -hmm. and I got that in from Germany. Okay. That cost me, I think, uh, about twelve hundred dollars. Okay. And I could only make one sheet every four minutes. Okay. So it was a laborious, very time consuming. yeah, very time okay. consuming. Okay. Uh, whereas nowadays I can do uh, about fifteen sheets a minute. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, so anyway, the benefits of small cell. So um, th things like uh, chalk brood, mm -hmm. which currently there was uh, there's been uh, talk by uh, Jody Gertz mm -hmm. as an example, who says that chalk brood has increased in its abundance in Australia mm -hmm. uh, over the last five or ten years mm -hmm. and if I was still on large cell I might even agree with her mm -hmm. but since I switched over to small cell each year I've seen a decrease in the amount of chalk brood I'm getting okay not an increase okay. so I would say my bees are going the opposite way to what she's talking about and you feel that that's um, yeah. attributed the, to the cell size the only thing I'm doing different mm. is I'm using small cell, mm. you know. So smaller bees, um, to me, it's like you know, big dogs and small dogs. Mm -hmm. Big dogs don't move so much compared to small dogs that move a lot more. Okay. And I see smaller bees as being just that little bit more hygienic 
mm-hmm. and always moving more and, and somehow um, they're able to bring in pollen and nectar from smaller flowers because that of the larger bees li- literally can't mm-hmm. land on because they, they fall over because yep. the flowers are too um, they're, they're too big for some flowers the bees are too bigger. heavy yeah, they're too heavy. Okay. The smaller bees, even though you're only talking about a 30% difference, mm, mm. but it makes a difference. Okay. And what's yeah. some other benefits? Yeah. Um, another benefit, uh, this, this applies particularly to people who live in areas of high humidity, yeah. is if you have smaller cells and smaller bees, they, and, and I don't have any scientific proof of this, but there are um, a number of beekeepers I know that did their own personal studies Mm -hmm. and they found this to be true but it needs to be researched a little more is they remove more moisture from the honey Mm. so if you're in an area where there's high humidity and there's a danger that bees will put away honey that has too much moisture um, going to small cell uh, can be a benefit because they're less likely to put away honey that's got too much moisture Okay. Yeah. And what about the um, hatching times? Uh, they Is there hatch any difference? Generally, uh, twenty-four to forty-eight hours earlier. Okay. Now. Um, and that there being is, a benefit for what reason? Now, it's, when it comes to varroa mites, it has a, a, a small impact on the varroa mites. Um, the studies done on varroa mites have looked at only, and, and this applies nearly to. 90% of the studies done in America where they look only at one issue and that is the number of mites in the beehive mm-hmm. and they found and most of the studies um, only go for six months to a, like a maximum 18 months and you don't feel that's long enough not nearly long enough because the first two major studies that were done yeah. both went for five years oh, okay. and one was done in Spain and the other was done in Africa. Mm-hmm. This has not been replicated okay. in America okay. or Europe okay. or Australia. Okay. But we don't have varroa mites here. No. Um, and what they found is that the two original studies that were done, um, they said, look, it's not the complete answer, but it certainly showed that there was a benefit okay. in helping the bees survive. Okay. Because the 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 issue with varroa mites is not how many mites there are in the box. Although a scientist might think that's important. Actually, the only thing that's important is do they survive? Mm. And Because there's been that new research recently, hasn't there, by that um, PhD student, wasn't it? Dr. Bugs. Yes, in yeah. America. Yeah. Who showed them attaching under he, on he the showed, plates. He show, it, prior to his research... Mm. Everyone believed that varroa mites sucked on the mm. hemolymph of bees, mm. which is the, the blood of bees. Mm. But he was able to categor- categorically prove mm. that the mites actually feed on the fat tissue of bees. And the fat tissue is where bees store all of their um, antibiotics and, and their resistance. The queen stores this her resistance to various things in that fat tissue okay. so if that fat tissue becomes damaged mm. yes it can it damages the bees okay. and when you see a mite standing on top of a bee that's a mite looking for a ride off a bee that's damaged yes because yes. otherwise they live underneath the bee inside the uh, the platelets yeah. and you can almost hardly see them yes yeah, yeah. no it's a it's a yeah. very worthwhile um yeah. Uh, interview that one that he's yeah. done on the variety. So, yeah. if people are interested, so, um, so, uh, so for example, so with so, sorry, one of the reasons yeah. we're here, of course, yeah. is because there was a little bit of controversy over some uh, uh, people that were sold foundation that were not given any information. Yeah, yeah. you know, that would appear that and, way. Yeah. yeah, and they were not made to or. Uh, to allow them to understand yeah. the process of when you change the cell size in a beehive, whether you're going up in a size, 
uh, if you go, if you change the cell size by more than 0.2 of a mil, mm -hmm. then the bees have to go through a transition process. Okay. Where they transition from one size to the other. Mm -hmm. And until you get enough bees of the new size in your beehive, the older bees will tend to want to build at their what they were previously making. Now, is that because of their yeah. head size? Generally, it's because yep. they want to build according to their head yeah. size. Yeah. So if you're going to change from larger bees down to smaller bees, those larger bees will rearrange some of those smaller cells. Right. So one way around that is to use full depth plastic foundation. Okay. So. But that's very expensive. Okay. And so we've got, so you will see some weird looking oh, stuff yeah. happening on your frames. Yeah, because yeah. they will probably, depending on the bees, their, their, their genetics and, and other factors, uh, a percentage of those cells, they will try and rework them back to being larger. Okay, so, yeah. so it's perfect. So for example, um, I decide that I'm going to put my girls mm. onto small cell and I do. Yep. And then I go in and do an inspection and I start to see some very strange patterns. This is normal. Okay. And um, how long am I going to expect to see it looking very strange? Well, what you will need to do is you, you have to let the bees breed in that for a period of time. Then you move that out, put some more foundation in. And within a number of generations... Yep. You can do it in one season. Most people do it over two or three seasons. Okay. You will transition all the bees down to being smaller. Okay. Once, once you've got more than 90% of the bees being smaller, you will no longer have an issue and all of the comb will be drawn out as normal. Equal. Yeah. Okay, because I'm on small cell foundation. I've yeah. been on small cell foundation for mm. how many? It's... It's a mm. long time now with you. It's three or four it's years. Gotta be, it's got to be, I think, about yeah. four years. So, and this, and I, I, mm. when I go and inspect my frames, they look exactly, everything's uniform. All the cells are uniform. Yeah. Okay? And that's, I can say that categorically. Um, and, and with this um, concern being raised recently about the uh, look of the frame being... Um, I do have a photo that I will um, post up with this video showing what Steve and I are talking about. But it does look really odd. You get big cells, small cells, nothing's... The, the not rhythm good. of cell making goes into a bit of chaos for a while. That's how I would describe it. Yeah. But the girls are okay. They are mm. fine. They are going to keep working mm. it. It, it. They will transition. It's a transition period. Mm. And then what happens now for me is when I look at my frames... They, they would look like a 5.4, you know, all perfect. So, and the girls are fine. Um, even with swarms that I, uh, or cutouts or anything that... Yeah. that yep. some, some swarms will go straight to small cell yeah. without a problem. Yeah. Some won't. Okay, it I've all, not all had depends, any trouble. It all depends on um, if they came out of a box that was, say, 5.6 mil. Oh, okay. Then that's very big. And you're asking the bees to make a really big change. Yeah. Yeah. And so that becomes a little harder. Yeah. So these companies that are now selling 5.6 mil foundation, um, when a person transitions to 4.9, that's a massive mm. jump. Mm. So if you make an active choice to say, I want to downsize my bees, but you don't want some of this transition happening, mm. or you want to minimize the amount of transition, you might actually have to do it in one in a couple of steps if you can get it maybe you can go down to 5.1 mil first where are you going to source all this I'm we're talking not... about we're talking about general yep hobby beekeepers and look even yep. commercial you know um you can get 4.9 hmm. there's uh myself in victoria there's a there's someone in new south wales and there's someone in queensland um, I have no idea about Western Australia or South Australia uh, or Northern Territory, but at least on the East Coast, uh, small cell is available. As to 5.1 or 5.2, I don't know of anybody. Yeah. You know? But it's not, you're not going to, there's no actual yeah. harm to your girls. No, it does not. By harm. going from 5.4, generally, 
Yeah, from, from going it's straight from straight into a small cell. From, yeah. from larger to smaller. It, There's no actual harm, but you will get yeah. a number of frames for a period of time. Yeah, the crazy look. That will yeah. not be uniform. And that's okay. And I think that's probably the biggest message that small. we would like to put across here with this interview yeah. is that it's okay. It's yeah. all right. Your girls are fine. They're just adapting. And yeah. then they will adapt. And before you know it, you've got perfectly drawn out kind yeah. that's it's in small cell, small cell size. So, and you've got little, you've got smaller bees, yeah. and it's it, quite obviously they're, they're yeah. significantly smaller. Yeah, yeah. It, it it is a, a shame though that it became like when you first told me mm. that this issue had come up, mm. um, I was a little surprised because most people who transition onto small cell. They make an active choice, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. from the research they've done. Yes. So they go, oh, so it has some potential to help with feral mites and disease, um, and and I know you you can end up with a, a better spring period from your bees, uh, less moisture in your in your honey, uh, so that you 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 go okay, that's what I want, and you do your research. So it's a conscious you decision. You would you would know what you were getting into. Yeah. yeah. Um, because yep. all the information is there. Yeah. But if you're just suddenly given something and you're not told what it is and you put it in and you see it, yeah, you, I, I agree. You would, you would... Yeah, I'd question it. Yeah, yeah. I'd have yeah, to go, yeah. what the... Is yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Okay. And of course, you, you, you're not used to seeing something like no, that. No, no. You know? Uh, and I see it, you know, when I put swarms into a box, I'm always interested to see, are they going to draw it out nicely straight up or have they come from a, a box where they need to be properly downsized mm. you know and it's always interesting to see which ones go best okay yeah so you haven't noticed a pattern with the Italians or the Carnolians or anybody there's no rhyme or it's, reason it's a mix no rhyme or reason no yeah no. It's, it's all down to the individual as, as we know every beehive has its yes. own personality yeah yeah, yeah. And okay. so you, you get a mix of personalities. Yeah. All right, Steve. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Look, it's been a great introduction yeah. into Small Cell. Mm -hmm. um, anyone's got any questions, please um, yeah. put them in to the um, comments underneath. Yeah. And if there's enough questions, then we can do another interview with Steve to answer those questions. All right. Yeah. So thank you very much for um, tuning in and we'll see you again. Thank you. Okay.